This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week's guest is Carol Smith, garden designer, lecturer, and author of the book, Gardening on a Gradient, Designing and Establishing Sloping Gardens. Interestingly, the book is relevant to home gardeners and professional designers, and it covers everything from the initial garden site assessment and survey, right through the design process to the final stages of planting. And it also gives inspiration and ideas from sloping gardens around the UK. If you've ever faced the challenge of a sloping site, you'll know how tricky they can be. But fear not, Carol is here to help you tackle them. A lot of the problems you encounter with a sloping garden, the basic problems, you know, if you want to eat outdoors, you need a flat surface to put your table and chairs on if the slope is steep then it can be dangerous if it's grass and it gets wet in the winter and you're trying to up and down the slope also planting on a slope the water is going to drain away down the slope so it's always going to be very dry at the top and damp at the bottom if you want a structure in the garden, such as a shed or a summer house or a greenhouse, you've got to have a flat area to put that on as well. So the main aim, really, when you're working with a slope, is to create flat areas that are either functional in terms of eating out or having a shed or a greenhouse and flatter planting areas. It does depend on how steep or how shallow the slope is as to the amount of work that needs to be done to achieve that. Obviously, the steeper the slope to create flat areas, the more expensive it's going to be because then you're looking at having to install retaining structures, you know, like walls, etc., and steps. It is very variable depending on how steep or how shallow the slope is. And actually, that raises a good point. Is it always going to be more expensive than gardening on the flat? Again, it depends on if it's a shallow slope. No, not necessarily, because that's much easier for somebody to dig out a flat area by themselves. But if you've got to install retaining structures, then really that's got to be done by a contractor. And that's where a lot of the expense comes in, obviously, because of the labour. Also, if it's a shallower slope, you can get away with what we call regrading the soil. So you get a digger on site and you move the soil around to create the flat areas. So again, it goes back to what I was saying before. It depends on how steep or how shallow the slope is. And what are the advantages to having a sloping garden? There's quite a few advantages, particularly if when you're looking out from the back of the house, the slope is going up away from the house because then what happens is you put steps and pathways in and beds and it's almost like you're creating an amphitheatre and if you sat on the patio outside at the back of the house you feel very enclosed and you know like a sense of privacy because it's almost like the garden wraps itself around you. You also get a fantastic microclimate in a garden where it's wrapping itself around you, which can obviously help with growing different plants and keeping them frost-free in the winter and that kind of thing. With a slope that is a downward slope away from the house, that can be more challenging because you want to be able to see the garden from the house. So it may be that you have to create a deck area which would be on stilts or if you put retaining structures in and then you backfill behind them to create the flat areas but even then you're still going to be challenged by that slope being away from the house that there are going to be lower parts of the garden that you can't see from the house. That's a really interesting point but also conversely if you have a garden that slopes towards the house are you then worrying about drainage? Can that be an issue? It can be an issue, but the simplest way to deal with that is that if you put retaining structures in, then you put in what we call eco channels. They're in the book and it's just like a shallow channel that's lined with almost like guttering with a grid over the top. So the water runs down the slope 
into the ACO channel and then that can be tracked away from the property. And most properties these days as well are built with a gravel trench around the house. Part of the idea with that is that any water that flows towards the house will soak into the gravel rather than sitting in puddles right next to the brickwork. So there are ways of dealing with it to manage that water. And also, I guess, if you were making changes to levels in a garden, you'd have to be careful about where the water might run off to instead, and that would include neighbouring properties as well, would it? Yeah, it usually goes into stormwater drains, and if it's a big enough garden, then you can have almost like an underground, not a tank built, but, you know, like a sump where it would go to. And then you can have a French drain put in, which is a trench away from the property to neighbouring open land. It just depends what the individual circumstances are as to how you manage it. And also thinking about the direction of water and where it might sit more than in other places, is it safe to assume that water will naturally accumulate at the bottom of a slope? Yeah, it is. If it's clay soil, clay soil tends to absorb more water and that's why it gets very thick and claggy. The amount that would run off clay slope would be less than if you've got free draining soil because free draining soil tends to be quite sandy and the water just runs straight through it, just soaks straight through it. So soils come into it as well in terms of how much runoff there is, as we call it. I guess as well that would have an impact on your planting choices across the site. Yeah, again, if you keep a slope, then the thing to bear in mind is that the soil at the top of the slope is always going to be drier than the soil at the bottom of the slope. If you terrace it and create the flatter areas, you will get more rainwater that is retained within those beds because they're flat. It will still soak through the soil, but vertically rather than down the slope. And is there any sort of similar patterning when it comes to temperatures and slopes? And I'm thinking again about plants. If a slope is south facing, it's going to get an awful lot of sun. So it's going to be dry because of the water runoff, but then also because it's receiving so much full sunlight. So what you would do is you would take a compass direction when you do the survey, work out which way the slope is facing, and then you would select your plants accordingly for the soil type, but also the direction, the aspect of the planting area. And actually, that's a really important thing which you do talk about in the book. And I think even professional designers can sometimes look at a slope in sight and think, oh, that's going to be a headache to survey, particularly, for example, if there were multiple level changes or there was maybe more than one direction of slope. If you are not a professional, do you think that sort of thing should be left to the professionals or are there tricks that you could use to simplify the process? Again, you know, it depends on the gradient of the slope. If it's really steep and it's quite big, then I would pull in a professional to survey it. If it's a member of the general public who really hasn't any experience at all, you know, you could call in a garden designer to have a look at it and then take it from there. If it's a fairly shallow slope, then it should be relatively easy to work out the gradient. Really, the first thing that you want to determine is the difference between the highest point in the garden and the lowest point. And once you've got that, then you can start to calculate things because you know what you're working with. So it depends on the size of the garden. And I feel like a record that's got stuck at the moment, how steep or how shallow the slope is, to whether it's something that could be tackled by somebody that's inexperienced. I think people generally would kind of instinctively know because they'd stand in the garden and look at it and think, well, where do I start? How do I do this? And all those questions would start running through their mind, which then points them in the direction of getting some professional help. And also, I think sometimes 
there's the assumption that a sloping garden, particularly if it's quite a dramatic slope, would be synonymous with hard landscaping. So if you want to reconcile the levels and make the site traversable, I'm guessing that you're going to need to put in certain structures. What are some of the common ways of, if you wanted to level the site, what are some of the more common ways of kind of doing that and making sure the soil's retained and everything's there ready to plant into? Retaining structures, the choices are obviously walls. Um, they can be brick with an inner skin of concrete block against the soil because you don't want the soil against the back of the brick because what happens then is in the winter is that the brick absorbs moisture and if it freezes, it blows the face of the bricks off. So that's why you'd always do um, like a cavity wall, brick outer skin, concrete block inner skin and then the soil. You can do sleepers, obviously not old railway sleepers because they're banned now. But if you do sleepers and you've got soil against the back of them, the best policy is to line the back of them with heavy duty black plastic. So that helps to protect the sleepers from absorbing lots of moisture. You could do stone wall. You could do gabions you know like the metal cages with rock or stone inside i have seen it done where you can use metal and they would use metal as a retainer if you kind of want almost like an invisible line so you don't want the change in level to be seen so when you do metal it's just a sheer edge almost a bit like an infinity swimming pool when you look at it, the surface meets the horizon, so it looks as if it's flush. There's rounded timbers. Again, if you use timber, you've got to think about protecting the back of it from water and moisture. That makes me think if you were going to try and level your garden, you're looking at quite a lot of work. If you wanted to have a sloping garden, you still wanted to make it usable, but you didn't want to have quite such an impact in terms of maybe cost or materials used, or you didn't want to disrupt the soil structure that's already there in the garden. Are there more naturalistic ways of dealing with a sloping site? In terms of retainers, not really. But what you can do is you can create terraces almost like turf terraces. So it would almost be like an undulating slope rather than a steeply sloping slope. Planting on a slope, if you were just going to use planting and not create flat terraces, you've got to think about getting stuff in that establishes really quickly. So you want to get some ground cover in, evergreen ground cover, and then some shrubs and possibly some trees. But the first step to stabilise the slope with planting is your evergreen ground cover because the roots have a natural tendency to spread outwards, so therefore will stabilise more soil. And are there any plants that you wouldn't use because of how their roots behave? I'm thinking about things that might have really prominent roots that could actually just stop coming through. Not really, no. There's nothing that springs to mind immediately. Obviously, you don't want to put in stuff that's what we would call quite invasive because then you're going to end up with big areas of one plant that completely dominates. With the ground cover, that's not so much of a problem because it's at ground level. But there are certain perennials, some of the persicarias spread like mad, which might be great initially to stabilise it. But then, as I say, you've just got big areas of one plant, which is not usually what most people would want. And also, I guess, if you were thinking about maybe having turf, is there a maximum gradient, for example, above which you wouldn't lay turf or seed turf? Yeah, with turf, what you've got to think of is ease of maintenance. So it's going to be a shallow slope for turf. Um, Again, because even if you've got a hover mower, if you're trying to work on a steep slope, it's really hard. So you would go for a shallower slope. 
I have to say, having done maintenance on sloping gardens, it's unbelievably difficult to do it to keep yourself stable when you're on a slope. Even if you're yeah. doing something like weeding or pruning, it's really, really hard work. So I'm guessing yeah. you might say, you know, to make it easy on yourself, if you're having a relatively high maintenance or even a bed that needs some maintenance, I guess the ideal situation would be to level it, wouldn't it? Yeah. One of the things I talk about in the book as well is instead of ordinary grass turf that needs mowing, let's say, every couple of weeks or through the summer, you could go for meadow turf. It's a bigger outlay in the beginning. You can try and seed meadows, but it's not always very successful from a germination point of view and in terms of the continuity of the germination. So it's worth investing a bit more money and going for meadow turf which then, because it's meadow grasses and meadow flowers, only needs cutting back twice a year. So it reduces the maintenance. But it, again, it depends what kind of effect and what kind of planting scheme you want initially. And again, you cover that in the book, you go through the different styles. So it's going to be dependent on that and guided by it. And kind of thinking about good examples of sloping gardens, can you think of maybe one large scale sloping garden or maybe one small oh, scale powers castle bodment the eden project they're really good examples i mean the eden project outside the restaurant there's an incredible bank which they used for growing veg for the restaurant bodment has used quite a few of their slopes for waterfalls and that kind of thing I think Kiftsgate you might have in the book, actually. That's really slopey. That's right, Kiftsgate. That's the other one I was trying to think of, yeah. Yeah, they've definitely done a, a good job with that. Actually, that's one of them gardens where you stand at the top and you look down and you go, if I walk all the way down there, it better be good when I get down there because that's, that's a long way <laughs> yeah, down and it's a, a longer way steps, back up. Isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> My final question is, if you were going to move house, and you went to look at a beautiful house and it had a really sloping garden that didn't have anything done to it and you knew you were going to have to do the work and you saw another beautiful house with a flat garden, which one would you pick? If the garden was sloping towards the house, I would pick the sloping garden. Um, my own garden's on three different levels and the slope is towards the house and it just makes the garden so interesting and gives you so many different planting opportunities. And you kind of feel like you're going on a journey when you walk around it. If the slope was away from the house, no, I wouldn't buy it. I'd go for the flat one. Thank you very much to Carol and thank you to you for listening. I hope that's helped those of you dealing with tricky sloping gardens. I leave you now with Dr Ian Bedford. I'd just like to say, I know people think I'm mad, but I really like cellar spiders and I leave them to populate the corners of all my rooms. A couple of times there have been huge hairy spiders in my house, which I know it's bad, but I normally evict unless they're not in my immediate presence. On a few occasions I've left them where they are overnight, and by the morning they're all wrapped up in a cellar spider's web and they've been eaten, so think on the next time you brush those spindly little spiders out of your house. They're almost invisible, but they're lethal killing machines. Each year, the arrival of autumn heralds a few anxious weeks for the arachnophobes amongst us. Since this is the time of year we call the spider season, the period when many of Britain's 650 spider species have become fully grown and are now far more obvious to us. Whether it's a garden orb spider in the centre of a big sticky web that it had spun overnight across a garden path, or a spindly-legged cellar spider in the corner of the garage, who bobs up and down when the light is switched on. Or perhaps a glossy-bodied false widow, clinging to a log that's taken from the woodpile. But probably, the spiders that cause most concern to arachnophobes are the large hairy ones that during autumn seem to be out to invade our homes. The house spiders, with their impressive leg span of around three inches and a running speed of around one mile an hour. But assuming that they'll have entered from the outside world through an overflow pipe, gaps in floorboards or perhaps an open window or door will unfortunately be wrong. <laughs>
since the house spiders, as their name suggests, will almost certainly have spent all of their life inside our home, hidden away within a tangle of webbing, where they'll have remained relatively inactive for sometimes up to two years, feeding on a wide variety of bugs that inadvertently venture within reach of their fangs. So why during autumn would they leave the safety of their webs to scuttle around our homes? Well, it's not all the resident house spiders that are doing so, but just the mature males ready to mate, and so they go out searching for a female. A receptive, mature female that'll be waiting somewhere within the house, perhaps under a sideboard or at the back of a kitchen cupboard. Tracking down the female spiders by following their chemical scent, the males cautiously mate with them. Then, if they avoid becoming her next meal, they'll wander off to die. Which brings the annual spider season to a close. Meanwhile, though, the mated females remain dormant amongst their messy blankets or webbing until the following spring, when they awaken to perform their final task spinning silken sacks that they fill with eggs and suspend within their web before their lives all come to an end. Then around six weeks later, a small hole appears in the egg sacks, out of which emerge around 50 tiny spiderlings, minute, inconspicuous spiderlings that disperse around our homes to places where they can each spin a messy web, catch unwary bugs to eat, and for the few that survive the following two years, develop into large, hairy house spiders. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.